Hi, everybody. I hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm very, very excited because we get to talk to, I think, one of the greatest drummers that the UK has ever produced. Coming for a period of time which is very near and dear to my heart, and that is the mid-late 70s to the mid-80s, where punk and post-punk and new wave and ska and new romantics, all of it just exploded in such a short period of time. And at the forefront of that was a drummer I admire so much, Mr. Pete Thomas. Pete Thomas, as I'm sure you're all aware, is the drummer of The Attractions and, of course, now The Imposters, who have been playing with Elvis Costello for several decades now. He's not just a backing drummer, he's a massive session drummer who's played with everybody. And what I love about him is he is a stylist. When Pete plays, you know it's him. He's not just playing a groove or a feel, which he does incredible. He is putting his personality and adding parts to songs that really differentiate them. You can tell that he listens to Charlie Watts and Keith Moon and Ringo Starr and knows what drums can really do. Not just bring groove and feel, but also add to the song. He's a song drummer. And without further ado, let's chat with Mr. Pete Thomas. When we recorded Pump It Up, this is how I played it. It's, I, I don't quite play it like this anymore, but this, this is how the original part was played. Fantastic. And, uh, yeah, Pump It Up was a great one. That was done at Eden Studios, just up the road from the Swan Pub, where we went quite a lot. And one morning, Elvis just came in. He was in a really good mood. He just got out of the cab. He came in. He just played it to us. I, I think he'd sort of had it for a while, but he just worked on it the night before or in the cab coming to the studio, whatever it was. And he just played it to us. And you know, you, you sort of know it's a great one. And there's a section in the middle where there's a breakdown. Well, there is now, and I, I, which I think I might have suggested because it reminded me of um, Satisfaction, you know, by the Stones. And, you know, that's got the famous. Da -da 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 in the middle and so so we put a breakdown in the middle uh, in a similar sort of way anyway i'll play a bit of pump it up and see if the drums fit
When you play a great song, when someone comes in with a great song, they sort of play themselves. You know, that's kind of what I found over the years, which is probably why the Beatles were so great, because it's just all you had to do was play it, you know. And uh, I can't remember anything about Nick particularly on that day, but, uh, you know, I'm sure he probably went, that's the one, don't touch a thing, come and hear it. That used to be the call was, come in and hear it. And, you know, there would always be a, a case of Blue Nun, Lieberfrau milk, revolting. And we would, we would get through a case of it every day, probably. I don't know why, that was just the... We all thought it was really great, you know, like Blue Nun. But uh, so that probably helped, you know, and then we'd all go down the pub, down to the Swan and, you, you know, we didn't think too much about it really. It's just, it just seemed like that's how life should be, you know, just come in the studio and make fantastic records. Now, was it? Pretty much everything live off the floor. Was there any overdubs? I can't remember. There might be, but nothing much. You know, I'm sure the vocal was probably live. No, that's just how you did it, you know. I don't know. Elvis has got a better memory than me. He he probably remember exactly what happened. But, uh, but, you know, and it's a very simple drum part. Really before I had time to overcomplicate it. You know, it's it's just it's just you know in the verse and then the choruses are just and that's that's all you need, you know. Yeah and it's been used in Nike commercials and Ford commercials and you know we still we still always end the show with it. You know, it's one of our real mainstays, you know. Just all those adventures, just being young, you know, and charging around. And I mean, we didn't always play terribly well, but, you know, it was before YouTube and everything, you know, and it, so it didn't really matter. You know? <laughs> Less accountability. Yeah. So you're born in Sheffield in 54. But you moved to Kent in '64. Is that correct? I'm not sure. No, I was definitely born in Sheffield. I mean, I was all right at school until I was about 15, and then I discovered Jimi Hendrix and the Who and the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, and there were people selling hash at the school gates. And what are you like, 14, 15, 16? Yeah, about 15, 15? really. Okay. So, you know, my O-levels were a disaster. Well, I just wasn't going at that point. There was a load of hippies that lived down by the river in a caravan. So I'd go down there. And I also discovered that Mitch Mitchell had a house that was only a few miles away. So I used to hitchhike out to his house and just stand by the gate in my great coat with my first moustache. You know, it, it, my life just became more rock and roll sort of related at that age. And so I sort of flunked my exams. And then my mum sent me to a, no, my parents sent me to a cramming school where I got a couple more O levels in Brighton, like geography and English or, you know, something. But, but by then I was playing in bands, local bands. There, there was a band called The Grobs, which was me and Pete and Paul. And, uh, you know, we just used to play Rock Me Baby and, you know, Cream songs and Jimi Hendrix songs. And my parents weren't very keen to buy me drums. So I had to figure it out myself, you know. So I, I had to paper around and, you know, various jobs. I worked in a butcher's on the weekends and in the summer. And, and so I had a drum kit, but it was made up of you know, I had a premier tom-tom, an old marching bass drum from the 40s. You know, it was all a mishmash. But I stripped them all, and, and they were, so they were a wood finish. So they kind of looked like a kit. And then when I left school, I got a job on the docks in New Haven, 
with a haulage company called Covent Garden Haulage. And I saved £225. And with that, I, uh, I found a drum kit advertised in the Melody Maker. I got my friend, who was a window cleaner, to drive me up to London in his van. And we went to a house in Acton that belonged to a drummer called John Woods, who was in a band called Vinegar Joe, which was Robert Palmer's first band with Elkie Brooks. Anyway, we got to this house and I saw the drums. I liked them. I gave him the money and I still play those drums today. This is the 1958. This is the kit that's on all the Elvis Costello records that I use on all the sessions I can get it on, you know, and uh, I use it in my little studio at home. I mean, I've got other kits. I've got some great DW kits, you know, they, they sponsor me. I use the DW kits on the road all the time because they're more um, reliable, you know. But this... They're not as precious to you. Yeah, this is my baby. I mean, I worked all, all that, you know, I, I shifted a lot of bananas to get this. <laughs> and so I started answering ads in the Melody Maker for bands, for jobs in London. And there was a band called Ocean looking for a drummer. And so I went up to London and went to an audition and I got the audition. And they were, I liked them because they were sort of a bit country rock, which, you know, I started out liking The Who and Jimi Hendrix and The Stones, but, but I also developed an interest in uh, American kind of country rock. There was a band in England called Quiver, whose bass player was called Bruce Thomas, who I later got to know quite well. Very well indeed. Eight right. albums worth. Yeah. The other useful thing was that they were all rich kids. One of them was called Mark Fry, and he was a Fry from Fry's Chocolates. Oh. And, and we would go and rehearse in a mansion outside Bath. And there were a few, quite a few girls with sort of velvet dresses and all called like Olivia and things, you know. And, and so Porsche. I... Yes, I quite liked that, but they weren't earning any money. So then I'd got myself a job. First of all, I was delivering, I was pretending to be a student and selling paintings that I'd created on wood, molded onto wood. But one day I went to a house and the, the guy opened the door and I saw over his shoulder a Ludwig drum kit and I just said to him, oh my God, that's a Ludwig drum kit. I forgot all about me pretending to be a student art student and he invited me in and he was really kind and he gave me a job at the Dallas Arbiter Musical Instrument Warehouse in Perivale. I was there probably for another year and a half or something and then I got into a band in London called Chili Willy and the Red Hot Peppers mm -hmm. which was very country rock. We got 12 pounds a week. And I was able to move into a squat in Holland Road with my, well, with the lady who's my wife now, Judy. And we had a camping stove, camping gas, a cold water tap. And that was it. Anyway, we lived there and I was in Chili Willy and that was fantastic because the two uh, lead guys, Phil Lithman and Martin Stone, were real Americana enthusiasts. You know, so I learned about Little Feet, the Flying Burrito Brothers, Graham Parsons, the Birds, you know, blues. Like th that was my real Americana uh, musical education. And anybody in England that liked that stuff would come and see Chilly Willy. You know, that's kind of the role that we fulfilled. But we were part of a scene called the pub rock scene. There was five or six bands. There was Brinsley Schwartz, which was with Nick Lowe on bass, who were the senior band. Like, we all respected them. They, they were really the English version of the band, 
you know. And in fact, when the band came to England for a tour, they actually went and stayed with Brinsley Schwartz, which just blew everybody's minds. No one could believe it, you know. So I played in Tilly Willy for about two, two and a half years. And we did so many shows. We would do 250, 260 shows a year, all around England. First of all, we had a post office van. Then we had the Haver van, which was a Ford, but no windows or anything. So you had to sit in the back on top of the gear. We made a hole in the top that you could stick your head out. But So I did that. So that's when I learned about playing live. You know, I'm sure we did at least six or seven hundred shows and you know that's when you learn how to work an audience and stuff you know and your first album with them was bongos over Balham, which is the really the first album i ever made with anybody in 1974 1974 bongos over Balham, and, and well we had two sessions for that one of them was in ronnie lane's car um, ronnie lane's mobile studio which was in an airstream caravan which we decided to park in a farm in devon it was like mud everywhere you know everyone had wellington boots but the engineer was ron neverson somebody he i can't remember how we found him but he was like a real engineer he'd just done quadrophenia with the who and he showed up with his rolls royce uh, in the mud, you know, but I was playing these drums and he showed me how to tune the drums. It's the same method I used all through the Elvis Costello records, which is just with a single diplomat head on the top, just tuned tight across from two lugs. And then you just bring up a third lug until you get a do, you, you get a dip, you get the note and the fingers just give you a dip. And I used that uh, for a long time because that's the only way I knew how to do it. But that's, he'd also done Bad Company and he'd learnt that from Simon Kirk. So, His toms were immaculately tuned. Yes, and that's, yeah. apparently, that's how he did them, at least for a while, you know. Simon would always get the pitch of the song, wouldn't he? he was always yeah. Like, da -dum -dum -dum. Oh, fantastic, fantastic player, fantastic player. It's, Totally in the groove, you know. Fire and water, what a, what a record. Oh, I, I know, so, and so sparse. Yeah. You know. But eventually, Chilly Willy sort of hit a wall. You know, the, the album didn't do particularly well, and the two front guys were older than me. And I, I, it sort of just ran its course, really. But before we broke up, we did a big party at the Roundhouse in London for a magazine called Zigzag, like an old hippie magazine. And on the bill was Mike Nesmith and Red Rhodes, just the two of them. So a couple of things happened. First of all, our manager convinced Mike Nesmith and Red Rhodes to help with Bongos Over Balham. So three of the tracks on there are produced by Mike Nesmith and Red Rhodes is playing pedal steel on them. That was fantastic, you know, because that was the first producer I'd ever met. And, you know, none of us had ever really seen a pedal steel. And so that happened. But also on the bill after Chilly Willy was an American folk singer called John, John Stewart, who wrote Daydream Believer. And he was also in the Kingston Trio. He didn't know how big the show was. But when he got there, he realized. So I got a phone call from RCA, from his record company, basically just because I was the drummer on before him. And they just said, John Stewart needs a drummer. Can you learn these songs? So, I mean, I was thrilled. And 20 years old, that's a great opportunity. Yeah. And so I did. And after the Chilly Willy set, I did the John Stewart set. And it went really well. And after the show, he foolishly, really, probably, said to me, well, Pete, if ever you want a job, just give me a call, you know. So I was like, oh, yeah, right, you know. So that's how you ended up going to California. Uh, well, and then, <laughs> then Chilly Willy broke up like four or five months later. 
I was still in the squat. I had nothing going on. So I got a stack of Tempe bits. And it was raining. I went in the phone box with this number, which I'd kept, stuffing all the Tempe's in. And I called America. It was the first time I'd ever done that, you know. And I called America and he answered, like, hello. I'm like, oh, hello, John, it's Pete. You remember me, you know, the drummer that did the show, you know. You said to call you if ever. It was quiet. And then he just said, how does 500 a week sound? <laughs> and I was like, what? You know, you're kidding me. Because apparently he was just about to start a tour. He'd got an album out called Gold, you know, people out there, it, which was, he'd got Lindsay Buckingham on it. It was kind of a big deal. So he had a tour and he just had an argument with his drummer. So it was just that lucky. Divine intervention. Yeah, divine intervention. So, so I ran back into Judy, you know, in the freezing squat in London and I'm like, guess what? It's just, you know. So he paid for both of us to fly over there. We, we had to pay him back, you know, he, le he lent us the money. First, we lived in Santa Monica for a while, and then we moved into a house in Topanga Canyon, which was another like eye-opener for the whole country rock thing. Like, w my wife worked in um, a vintage clothes store up there, a shack, and one day she called me and she said, Pete, Pete, Lowell George is in here. And she's like, so I ran down there, and I ran in like, huh. and, and there's Lowell George like trying on a cowboy shirt, you know. So I got talking to him, and he was really nice, and he ended up inviting me up to his house. I recorded with him a little bit, you know. He showed me how to play reggae, his version of reggae. This, this is on Richie Hayward's kit, the black premiere kit. So things like that happened, you know, and, and there was a club up there called the Corral where you could go and see Albert Lee. And, um, that would have been, what, head, hands and feet kind of time, but he'd moved to... It was a bit, it was after that. Just it was a bit after, a bit after, after that. that. Yeah. But also you were going to London, and the, meanwhile in England, the punk thing had started, and our old managed, our old roadie with Chilly Willie had now become the head of Stiff Records. He'd started Stiff Records with Dave Robbins. So he showed up in LA. He came to visit me. He was with The Damned, and, and Nick Lowe was with him. And so I went, you know, I went to see The Damned. And, and meanwhile, I'd become friends with an American band called, called Clover. You know, a bit like the band, but from the Bay Area. And I'd actually gone to their, one of their houses in San Francisco and introduced myself. They were playing in LA at the Palomino. So I took Jake and Nick to see Clover. And we ended up sitting in, because Nick knew their songs. And Jake was so knocked out with them that he signed them and took them back to England, where they recorded Elvis's first album where they did My Aim Is True. So in a way, I kind of a and r that a little bit, you know, nice. in a roundabout way. So that all happened. And then Jake came back again a few months later with the album, with Elvis's album. And he said, listen to this, it's fantastic. He's going to need a band. I said, if you come back to England, you know, Elvis knows who you are from the old Chilly Willy days. So if you come back to England, you know, you, you should be able to get the job, you know. So, you know, it was only like 21 or 22 or something. So I was like, oh, okay. So we went back to England, met up with Elvis and, uh, and did the auditions. Was he Elvis in those days? Really? He was. He'd become Elvis then. I mean, I'd known him kind of from before, but, but not really. But So we did that. And then they were looking for a bass player and there was an ad in the Melody Maker and this, and then Elvis said to me, this guy's rang up called Bruce Thomas. Like he's been in some other bands and I just lost it. I was like, Oh my God, it's Bruce Thomas, you know, cause I loved Quiver, his, his old band. I used to go and see him all the time. I said, Oh my God, he's amazing. He's fantastic. 
Which was good enough for Elvis. He just went, okay, that, fine. The yeah. Rhythm section sorted out. Rhythm section sorted out. Mm. And it was great, you know, playing with Bruce. I mean, he's an amazing bass player. So, and then Steve Naive, there were some keyboard players auditioning. I think he was the first one in. He came in, did his audition, then he f***ed up all the settings for the next guy. <laughs> and, then, and then he went and he brought a bottle of whiskey with him and he went and sat in the hallway outside basically guzzled the whiskey. I thought you were going to say he was going to get the other guys drunk. <laughs> no, he, no, he got himself drunk. Right. And, and everybody left, all the other keyboard players, and we went, we went out into the hallway, and he was just there, like asleep with this empty bottle of whiskey. And we all just looked at him, and we were like, well, this is the guy, obviously. You know, <laughs> like, like, here he is, you know. So that was the band sorted out. And then we, we, you know, we, we did a few shows and we went off to rehearse in Devon again, in an old, on an old RAF airbase, in like in this, this old Nissan hut. That I think Jake's girlfriend knew someone down there or something. And we rehearsed there and we went to the pub every night. And, and Elvis had written all the songs for this year's model. So we learned the songs from Miami's True, but we also learned all this, like Lipstick Vogue. We learned all those songs in this old corrugated iron hut in the middle of a bleak airfield. And I could remember the afternoon when we came up with Lipstick Vogue, you know, with the pattern and everything. Amazing. That's the intro. And I can still remember the afternoon where he was playing the guitar with the riff and that it just kind of came to me, you know, like, oh, okay, I can do this, you know. And it's still one of people's favorite songs. That was a great time for drumming. Well, it, because it was a thing with, with the punk thing and Nick Lowe producing. Because of the damned New Rose has that great drum intro New as Rose, well. New Rose, yeah. Yeah, it was it was a fashion for the drums to be loud. Great, you know, and and yeah, unfortunately, it hasn't really reappeared. Not yet. Not yet. But yes, it was, and and you know, Elvis said the last track he cut before I joined was watching the detectives with Steve Golding with from Graham incident. Parker and the Rumor, and. They were loud, the drums were loud, and there was a very distinctive intro. You must have played that a hundred thousand times. I have. I mean, I can demonstrate it. And the weird thing is that it, it was done on these drums. Really? Yes, because I'd left these drums in England when I went to America with a friend of mine, Bobby Irwin, who was also involved with stiff. So this, this kit became the stiff kit. So even though I didn't play that. Your drums did. My drums did. <laughs> yeah. When we cut Chelsea, I don't want to go to Chelsea, which was a similar, you know, I could tell that was going to be like a similar sort of track, you know, a bit funky and Elvis wanted a drum intro. And I'm like, okay, this is it. This is the moment, you know, so there was a song by uh, Jimi Hendrix called Fire, where, where it goes, uh, dun, 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 dun. That bit, that last bit. I was like, okay, so Chelsea, the beginning of it is, I stole that from Mitch Mitchell. So yeah, so then we cut this year's model, which was really good fun because, you know, it, all the influences were the Kinks, the Who, the Stones, the Beatles, you know, and, and I think at that time, I just thought that was really all Elvis was into. 
because we're exactly the same age. But then later on, he went on to get interested in all sorts of other styles and things, you know. But, but for a while there, we were just a good old British beat group, you know. And uh, so we did that. And then we really set off on our adventures, you know. Then we went off touring America. And, and it was a great time to tour America. You know, it was like 77, 78. It was only 10 years after the swing in 60s. So you could still go to thrift stores. You could still buy button-down shirts, skinny ties, shiny jackets. I mean, they, they were just all there because it wasn't that long and before, really. I mean, it seemed like an eternity to us since the Beatles, and, but, but it wasn't. So we had real fun getting all kitted up, you know, and, and you could buy vintage guitars you could buy an old strat for two hundred dollars in a thrift store and you know fantastic time nick Lowe had got with rock pile you know so we would work with them there was squeeze were on the go so we'd tour with them so you know we had a good gang of friends there was also a lot of bands that we hated you know i mean <laughs> and we were sort of taught to be horrible like our our manager jake actually encouraged sort of horribleness you know it was it was a it was the fashion you know like with the sex pistols and he's he, he's he taught me once he said you want to know how you can really piss off a bouncer in a club like well i suppose so you know like sort of middle class boy from Seaford, you know. He's like, you just tell them, you know what you don't like about me? I'm young and rich. <laughs> and I think I tried it one night when I was drunk, you know, and it, yeah, it didn't go down at all well, you know. <laughs> but, you know, and Elvis was storming around. He became Mr. Angry, you know, that was sort of his thing. So he, he just played it up, you know. I mean, he's not really, but... but I think publicly as a kid, I, th I actually always thought he was one of the nicer guys. He is really, he yeah. is really. But, but you know, it was great storming around on stage and then he'd go running off across the tables, you know, and then we'd go off and not do an encore and, you know. And, we, and we, it was really good fun. You know, we, we were supposed to do a tour with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. I think the first show was in Chicago. And we went on like crazy, you know, everything really fast. And, and, and then we did five encores. Like the audience was just like tearing the seats up and everything. And, and it was being broadcast on a radio. And we, we, we went off in our, in our van or our bus and we were listening to the radio and the, and the DJ was going, oh my God, they've, they've gone, it's pandemonium here, you know. And we just thought it was hilarious. And then the next day, we got a call from Tom Petty's management, you know, like, we don't think this is going to work out, you know. <laughs> so, so, so we didn't do the tour with Tom Petty, but, you know, but we're friends with, you know, we've stayed friends with them. So you, you just touched on um, Mitch Mitchell being an influence. What, do you remember that moment where you're like, I want to be a drummer? Well, that was when I was nine. That that's, I just saw the Beatles on TV, and I think it was the same for thousands of people. You know, you just see Ringo at the back there, all these girls going crazy. You know, they're everybody loves them. Like that's the job for me. <laughs> that's you know, like I like that idea. I did speaking going back to Mitch Mitchell when I used to hang around outside his house. Eventually, one day, his roadie came down and, and it was called Nunu, and I, I met him later. Years later, he ran a hire company at Nomis. And he said, you want to come and see Mitch's drums? I was like, oh, really? You know, and so he, there was a studio in the garden and he took me in, and the first thing I saw was all these Marshall stacks with JHX written on. Like, oh my God, you know. And, and then in the middle of the room, there was a sort of 
like a, a swimming pool, but you know, not with any water, but a dip. And there was the five kits, like the double black Gretsch kit, the Ludwig kit with the 24-inch bass drum, like all the Mitch Mitchell drum kits. And he let me have a go on them. And, and then he said, do you want to come up to the house and meet Mitch? And the house looked like the cover of Axis Boulder's Love. It was like Georgian mansion with flowers all over it. And, and Mitch came to the door and he had the yellow crushed velvet flares, this chiffon shirt. What the year is this? This is just after Jimi Hendrix died. Oh, okay. So is that 70, 71? 71, yeah. So anyway, he was really nice and he came to the door and he's, you know, he was a bit, as you, you know, perfect, you know. He, was, he says, oh, come in, man, you know. He says, you want a drink? Absolutely, you know. So there was this. There was a, a lady in the kitchen. I could see just a blonde goddess. And he, he says, "Oh, you know, get a drink." And so she came out with her a vodka and orange, fresh squeezed orange. It's the first vodka and orange I'd ever had. You know, and the whole thing was just unbelievable. And then he took me in his music room, where he had four quadraphonic Bose speakers and all these tapestries and, you know, Afghan and, you know, and, and he sat me down and he played me some um, Elvin Jones and, that, and then he talked to me a little bit. And, but the only thing I really remember him saying was, if you're a drummer, you're only as good as the people you play with. And I always remembered that. It's like basically just aim yourself at the best players, um, you know, and they'll make you sound good. I mean, it, you can be a great drummer, but if you're playing with people who aren't very good, you're not going to sound very good. And you can be an okay drummer, which I think I am kind of okay, but play with great people. You're a lot more than okay, my friend. Well, but you know what I mean? Like, if, if you're playing with, with somebody fantastic, then... It's going to sound great, you know. But then also, I, I think your groove, your feel, everything's fantastic. But it's the parts that you come up with. And that's the creativity, I think, is another thing that's important in that. In that, that, of, that is a thing. That, yeah. that is a thing. And, and sometimes when you're in a situation where you need to come up with something... It's like a light that goes on. And I, I find that, that um, really, if you have discipline, you know, if, if you, like if, if someone sends me songs to learn, I, I make myself listen to it 10 times at least, but, but no less than 10 times. No matter what it is, you know, I mean, I'll write out a chart, but there's, there's a point where it gets in your head and you can sing it to yourself while you're walking around. You know, if you go down to the shops and you've got it in your head, then you can, then you can be like, oh no, you know, what, or maybe, you know, like walking speed, you know, like maybe if it was a bit faster or, you know, and you need to be able to do that. You, you know, you, or I do anyway. And then... You know, if you need a fill into something or a... I mean, I've got, I've got a lot of kind of cheaty ways of doing it. But, but there are moments where it just sort of comes to you, you know, and, and you're eternally grateful sort of thing, you know. It's like, oh, yeah. Like the Lipstick Vogue thing. I mean, that just... It was like, oh, I'll do this. And, you know, it doesn't always happen. But, but generally, if... If the music is good, if it's a good song, then you'll be all right, you know. It, the harder thing when you're doing sessions is when people sort of want you to fix it, you know, like they want you to make it interesting. Like, oh, can you do a sort of broken down percussion thing, but, you know, make it like, but not, don't play the regular beat, you know, like what they're really saying is, it's boring, can you think of something? and. 
that's much harder because you never, it's like polishing a turd, you know, you're, you're never really going to make much difference. But, but the, yeah, I mean, I've come up with a few parts. It is interesting. I was thinking when you were talking about Elvis as being, and, and the first recordings you did, sort of echoing the Kinks and the Beatles and how, you know, we think of punk and new wave of that period of sort of rejecting that, but all the musicians that were making those records were huge fans of those bands. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody just got their hair cut. I mean, I think Joe Strummer. <laughs> Joe Strummer, yeah. You know, The Clash. I mean, that, but, but that's part of what that time was. That, that was the sort of heritage that everyone had grown up with but then maybe they're not that good, so they just want to play simpler, you know, and, and that's, you know, the 60s was one thing. That was all the bands that liked the blues and the American influence. And then the next generation, well, I guess there were in the early 70s, there was all that kind of prog rock and everything. But, but you know, my influences were... Ringo and Charlie Watts, you know, my influences were the guys that were in the previous generation influenced by all the American bands, you know, but it was like a sort of another stage. You know, it wasn't till later that I discovered the drummers that Ringo had liked or, you know, and so it was, I mean, we were just living our dream with Elvis, you know, of being an English beat group. I mean, that's what set Elvis and, and Squeeze and bands like that from aside because the songwriting was so good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm still playing with Elvis now, mm -hmm. you know, like 44 years later. I mean, who knew? But he's amazing. I mean, he is a genius, you know. I mean, he's a bona fide, you know, we might have ups and downs and things, but you can't deny that. I mean, and he can remember all the words. He's written over 500 songs. I mean, that is extraordinary. You know, I mean, he is a very clever guy, you know. And, and you know, the, some of the songs are just fantastic on any level, just as a poem, you know. I mean, I worked with Suzanne Vega years later, and she just thought that Beyond Belief, you know, the song Beyond Belief, she, as a poem, was one of the most fantastic poems, you know. Now, I was so lucky to get in with him. I mean, no doubt about that. We spoke a little bit about Nick Lowe, and obviously, you know, he made this year's model with you. We spoke off camera earlier a little bit about him. I'd love to get some stories on. Yeah, well, Nick, Nick Lowe was just a little bit older than us. And we, because Brinsley Schwartz was so good, we just looked up to him. You know that they were they were just a bit ahead of us in every way and and Nick's another very bright guy, and he's also very charming and very witty and you know because he he was a reporter for a newspaper for a while, you know he was a writer um i mean if if you're ever in a situation with him with a, a group of people sitting around in a pub talking, or, you know, if there's some girls or something, it's forget it. I mean, Nick is so witty and so charming, you know. So that's part of his skill, you know, because he was so articulate, he was able to control situations in the studio, you know, where you've got, you know, Elvis will be getting a, you know, we used to call it a head, a head full of bees, you know, when, when it's all like, Dah! you know, because we would work up those arrangements, like in a sort of frenzy, you know, like, well, okay, so if you're going to go, do -do 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 -do, then I'll go, do -do -do -do, but only the first time, because the second time it's longer. Okay, but if you're, gonna, all right, so at the end of the second time, you know, there wasn't any pro tools and, you know, it was this intense thing. And we used to call it a head full of bees where you just get like, but Nick could con control it. He, you know, and because he was a bass player, he had a very good understanding of the drums. So you could talk about parts 
properly, you know, I'd, you know, be like, this is the bass drum pattern. That, you know, it wouldn't be like, oh, can you sort of make it sound like the kinks or, you know, which a lot of producers just, just you know, it's like, well, what does that mean? You know, I mean, Nick could really, it was specific, you know, you do a fill there, you stop here, do something, you know. He was articulate, he was clever at controlling the situation. You could work it up to a level, but then he would know because back then a take couldn't be fixed, you know. I mean, it was so it was a combination of everything that went down. Like the the version of I don't want to go to Chelsea. He just said to me, like, just try, just try loads of stuff. Just try, you know, I'd sort of got the intro, but in the body of the song, you can hear I'm 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 doing one thing one minute and then something else the next minute. And and when we finished. He, was, he just stood up and he go, that's it, that's it, that's the one. And I was mortified. I'm like, no, no, it isn't. I'm still working things out. He said, no. Like, the overall effect of it is great. And, you know, it was the vocal and everything. So he knew when to call it. You know, because we could have gone on for another five hours and God knows what we'd have ended up with. But that, you know, so... He was wise, you know, and also he's got a fantastic sense of rhythm. He's, he's, you know, you watch any rock pile. I mean, sometimes they got a bit fast, but that was for more sort of chemical reasons, you know, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, the way he plays rhythm guitar, like when, years later when we did Blood and Chocolate, the album Blood and Chocolate, you can barely hear it, but pretty much every track on that he sat in the middle of the room and played um, a nylon strung Spanish guitar. So that album, more than any of them really, has very steady tempos. And that's basically why, because he just, he was sitting there, he had a pickup on it or something, you know, but he, and he was just like, doom, 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 doom. He's got that arm, like we used to call it the ABBA arm where, you know, you play an acoustic and it's just like playing a tambourine. It's just steady, you know. So he, he had that fantastic sense of rhythm as well. And he, he was funny and we, everyone liked him, you know. Which, was the album cut to clicks or was it completely? No. It was generally Chase Me Charlie, you know, the first one home sort of thing, <laughs> you know. I mean... Groove wasn't so important then. It was more just a series of events, you know. It's like, if, well, I'm going to do this. Well, then I'll do it with you, you know. And I mean, some Bruce was good. Bruce was always kind of in front of the beat. But when you listen back to it, it, it I, I understand why, you know. He's, he's basically keeping it going, you know. Because Elvis just tends to play kind of almost like he's uh, playing an acoustic but on an electric, you know. He's... I mean, he will work on parts, but only under pressure, you know, like, like Nick used to get him to do things, but a lot of it was, that would be overdubs. So Bruce was really leading the thing. Now I got into to real serious groove later on, you know, once I moved to America and, and uh, calmed down a bit, you know, I sort of. Now you talked about Chelsea a second ago. I'd love to, love to hear that beat. Oh, Chelsea. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because the way I play it now is much more groove orientated. Oh, interesting. Because it's all about the hi hat. The, 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 the hi hat is basically. Um, you know, and the original record is kind of all over the place. But, but I still play the same intro that. Well. But now I tend to focus more on this, you know, and, and, and make it more like a train. So we extend it now, you know, we have solos and things and, and, and I enjoy it just being a train that people can get on, you know. I'm not, 
I'm not trying to think of all like, oh, what can I do now? Or, you know, because that tends to mess up the groove. It's just such, with the, with the guitar and bass, the way it locks together, just blah, 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 just. Yeah, good parts. No, I can't really remember how it happened, you know, it just all sort of did. I mean, everyone was young and bright and quite drunk, I think, probably, you know. But it has so many different feels about it. Like, it's all, it's reggae at some point. God know? knows. It's got all these different kind of grooves well, in it, which well, is just and, so and fantastic. And at the time, you're drawing on everything that's going on, you know. You're, you're, I don't know if the, I don't think the police had started then. But, you know, you're aware of, of all the other music that's in the charts and, you know, you, it's a funny combination of, of things, really, you know. I mean, I know later, later on, when we did that song Clubland, that was a total police ripoff. It didn't sound anything like the police, but, but I remember that's what I was thinking, you know. But Bob Marley was huge in England at the time. Yes. So there, there would have been a massive Bob Marley kind yeah. of influence. Yes, yeah. It was, it was everything that was around, you know. Two Tone was probably starting up yes. around there as well. That's a huge influence. Yeah, the specials. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there was all that going on. Incredible time. So I love this quote from Elvis. I'm sure you've been asked about this, where he, uh, Pete, where he says, Pete is the rock and roll drummer of his generation by a huge distance. The way he handled rhythm and kept time was like nothing any other drummer would have done. <laughs> That's my mate. <laughs> That's my friend. Well, I don't know about that, really. It says a lot. I mean, you've, you've done... If I, if I counted correctly, 22 albums together. Yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting because, you know, with the Stones, it's all about Keith and Charlie. Well, not anymore, but it was. And which I got to see very close up firsthand later on, you know. But, but me and Elvis have got a similar thing. Um, especially back then, you know, because Bruce, Bruce is, you know, he'd have a lot of treble on, he'd have his parts all worked out, he'd be pushing it forward, but it wasn't necessarily locked. I mean, obviously I would lock with him and stuff, but, but, but me and Elvis had a real link. I mean, I always have him loud. Is it a physical thing as well? Because I remember Martin Chambers saying he just watches Chrissy yes. and he can just play with her movement. Yes. Do, you, do you have that interaction? Yeah. I mean, Elvis's bottom probably isn't quite as nice as Chrissy's, <laughs> you know. But, but, as Chrissy's, no. But uh, totally, totally. It's, you know, because especially in the early days, it was almost like a circus sometimes, you know. He'd be storming about doing the funny legs and everything. And, and But musically, definitely. And also... He's got a very good idea of what he's doing, you know, of how the song goes. And, and it's there. You, if you listen for it, it's, it's all there. It's implied, you know. And he's because he doesn't really think he's a very good guitarist. But then you talk to Charlie Sexton, who's working with us at the moment, and he thinks Elvis is a genius be, because he's playing the song, you know. And in a big, big way. Like, you could take everything away. I mean, he does tours on his own, where he basically just plays the same part, and it's fine. I mean, the whole song is there. I saw a show at the Wilton where the PA went down. You have heard, you know, about were you that, that show? You must have been in yeah. LA. And he just carried on singing, and everybody just quietened down. Yeah. He yeah. can carry it, you're right. No, it's a force. It's a force, yeah. It is a force. So, yeah, me and him have definitely... Got, got a thing, uh, you know. I mean, since we got Davey on bass, we can do that, you know, because I play with Davey, I do sessions with him, and we've got our own band and stuff. So that, that's another way we can go. And, and then Elvis can not play so much, you know, he can just sing and just put little things in and stuff. So that, that's more of an imposter's sound, you know. But, but definitely in the early, day, early days, it was me and... Me and him, yeah. And we talked um, earlier about um, it's an obvious thing, and, and, and 
you became the imposters because when you got back together, you didn't have Bruce playing yeah. bass. Yeah, yeah, we had Davey. And also, we'd, there was a song, you know, on uh, Get Happy, I think, called The Imposter. And Elvis had produced a couple of records and called himself The Imposter. So it was sort of there in our history, you know, so it wasn't a huge leap to become The Imposters. And it's not a bad name. I think it might, it might have slowed things down a bit, you know. I think it pro probably if we'd gone on just as the attractions, we might have been able to do bigger places, uh, you know, early on when we got back together. But, but it wasn't. And I think it's good that we did that, you know. When you're recording now in this digital age, are you still able or still want to record stuff without clicks? Well, the trouble is, if you're going to record stuff without a click, you've got to have at least one alibi. There's got to be at least one person who is playing the song, you know. Like, if I could have my own pet rhythm guitarist that I could take with me everywhere that would just learn the chords and play them in time, not get bored halfway and start noodling around and stuff. I mean, you, it's very hard to do it if you're the only person playing the groove, you know, if everyone else is kind of not quite sure what they're doing or, you know, because it only takes a second to get off the train. So I do like doing it without a click, but I, it takes longer. You've got to rehearse the song. Everybody's got to be comfortable with it. It's, if you do it with a click, basically you can get it right on the drums and then you know, maybe the bass, if it's Davey, the bass will be good. And, you know, and then people will fix things and, and you know, the producer will move things around. I, I, I don't, people don't seem to want to spend the time. And ultimately, it's better. If you can play it without a click, it's better. But it's harder. It's harder to capture that, that moment, you know, where everybody locks and get the good vocal, and, you know, and, and everything. So what about with the newer Elvis stuff? How are you doing that? Well, the new Elvis stuff was was funny, really, because it was during the pandemic. And we're all at home. And I spoke to him. I talked to him quite a lot. And I, th I think I sort of said something, but he'd obviously been thinking it as well. You know, like, couldn't we do some, you know, what what can we do? And and so basically he bought everyone uh, some home gear, you know. You know, not much, like four or five thousand dollars maybe. He bought me a little Pro Tools rig and I think Davey had something. I think Steve had something, but, you know, whatever they needed he bought. And then, like he does just all these songs appeared, you know, like he just, he, he was doing the guitar and the vocal in his garden, like sitting on a bench in the back garden. And I just started getting these songs. And, um, you know, and then we had a producer, Sebastian, who, who was at home as well, and he'd come on Zoom, you know, and. It's, he'd listen to it and he'd be like, oh, try this, try that. And so he'd send me the guitar, then I'd put the drums on. You know, then we send it to Davey, he put the bass on. And, and it was done like that. And it came out good. But now we've started playing live again and we're playing those songs. They've sort of gone up a notch, you know, and, and I do find myself thinking, oh, God, you know, if only we could have you know, played this a little bit more live. But but in some ways, I think the versions are good, you know, because they're simple and they all work. You know, I mean, no one cares whether I could have done a fill here, you know, or I could have done the ending better or something, you know. So, and it kept us all busy. And, um, you know, now we've got something to promote when, you know, when we go back on the road, so. It was, it was good. I suppose it's a little, so I've sort of asked this question earlier, and you've actually talked about it, because you talked about, 
you weren't so much of a, as a groove drummer on the first on the first album, you know, on this year's model. But you've developed more into that. Yeah. And you've worked with so many great singer songwriters now, especially American artists, where that's what they're looking for. Yes. Yes. Do um, you think that's been the biggest part of your development as a drummer? I don't know. I, I sort of feel like I'm very immature person. You know, I, I, I feel like only now that I'm 67 do I get it. You know, like, like oh, you just play the beat. There's, and it'll all sound great, you know. Like I'm just sort of getting there. But after, you know, we, we were with Elvis until about 84 or 85. And then it, it, it had sort of reached a natural conclusion. And we also asked for a raise, which didn't go down very well. Um, he'd met T-Bone Burnett in America. And, and so basically he went off to America and we were laid off for a bit, you know, and which was awful. I sold my house and, you know, and then then me and Steve got a job on the Jonathan Ross show in the house band. I remember it well. So we did like four or five years and it, they had this weird rule where anyone that came on had to be backed by the band. So we got to play with Paul McCartney, Elton John, Roy Orbison, you know, Billy Idol, just everybody. everybody. It actually worked out great for me and Steve. And we had some hilarious moments doing that. We had to go and rehearse with Paul McCartney. And uh, we went down to his house. He met us, you know, and then he said to Steve, Steve was the band leader, you know. Steve's kind of in his own world a little bit sometimes, you know, and, and Paul McCartney just said, so uh, just play something you know, you know, just just have a jam, you know, just do whatever you do. And So Steve turns around to me and he says, Lucy in the sky with diamonds. I'm like, what? You <laughs> Steve, you didn't write that one. You know, it's like, what are we doing? Because we used to do it as a warm up on the TV show as an instrumental. You know, so I think Steve would just be like, oh, Beatles. Well, the Beatles. Yeah, well, listen, <laughs> that is the longest piece of music. Like, you know how long it seemed before it goes, boom, boom, boom. It was an eternity. And Paul McCartney's just standing there, like, you know, and I'm looking at him, oh my God. And then halfway through, his, his head just dropped. He's just like, and by then I'm thinking, oh no, we, we are so screwed. And then we finally get to the end, and his head comes up and he just says, at the end, I could hear John. And I'm like, my God. He got away with it. Like, and, and I got Steve outside afterwards. I'm like, you the fuck you did? You, know? like, 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 you got away with it. Like, but anyway, that was great. When we played with him, we got to do, I saw her standing there and, you know. And, uh, but anyway, so we did that TV show for a while. Then I started sort of going back with Elvis. The others didn't, but I did. I just figured life was too short, you know. And, and I went to America and did an album called Mighty Like a Rose with him, which Mitchell Froom was producing. So I met Mitchell Froom, the producer, and we got along and he sort of liked me. So after that, he started flying me out from England to Los Angeles to do sessions. One of the first sessions was Los Lobos which is unbelievable. Like to, to me and my friends in England, that was like this holy grail, you know, like, like oh my God. And, but it, he basically got me in not to play Americana, but to be me, you know, like a sort of English new wave or, you know, and make a different sort of thing, you know. And, but because I knew so much about country and blues and everything. I was more like, oh no, I know what this is. You know, I can, this, this. 
So I worked so hard. I played along with every album they ever made. I got the demos. I practiced with the demos. I did everything I could, you know, practiced it. And so that was one of the first sessions I did. And that was an album called Kiko, which had some great grooves on it. Fantastic and, album. And then from that, I think a lot of other people said like, to me, wait, this guy can do that? Yeah, yeah. And so then I got to do Bonnie Raitt and Sheryl Crow, Richard Thompson, Neil Finn, you know. I got Another to, incredible songwriter. And Suzanne Vega, you know, I, 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 I was on a roll, like in the, in the mid to end, the end of the 90s. You know, I almost felt like I was quite the guy, you know. I didn't, I knew better, but, but you could be forgiven for starting to think that you might be quite the guy, you know. But I think it's perhaps the same with film actors and stuff. You never think you've done it quite right, you know. I mean, there's a few of those tracks I can listen back to and go, oh, okay, that's, a, that's all right. But the, there's still, you're like, oh, I could have done that better. And Tell us a little bit about the Sheryl Crow song for Well, James Sheryl Bond. Crow, that was just, um, I, like, another one you know like i just got a call from mitchell to to um you know you want to come and do some work with cheryl crow it's like oh okay and there was a guitarist from england called steve donnelly who came with me who mitchell liked as well and the, the two of us actually played on quite a lot of records together we got in the studio with her and the thing that really struck me was how talented and professional and proficient she was you know like she played the song on the guitar she'd sing it it's perfect fantastic like you know then she'd say you know oh, i've got an idea for some lap steel you know and she'd get a lap steel out and pull, just play like brilliantly you know piano and she just got on the piano and be like you know she's a really talented and very nice you know, and I mean, if she doesn't like it, she lets you know she doesn't, it's not right, you know, but it's fine. And so I think I did, I guess that was her second album, Cheryl Crow. I think I ended up on like three or four tracks on that. There's one called Hard to Make a Stand, which came out pretty good. And I just did my a full Charlie Watts on it. It's like, okay. Sounds like the Stones to me. Let's not mess around. Let's just do what Charlie would, you know, what I think Charlie would do. And um, and other drummers have had to learn it live since, you know, and, and I've spoken to, there's one guy in particular, you know, it's just like, what the, you know, how did you get that? I'm trying to Jeremy tell. Jeremy Stacey? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure that one out, you know. <laughs> and... Um, you know, and I was learning stuff as I went along, like the Los Lobos, they, they taught me a lot. The, the one beat in particular that, that uh, David Hidalgo showed me, which is a way of playing rock and roll, but with a swing to it, which is, it's basic, it's, it's, there's a song called Whiskey Trail that I did with them. And, and it's, um, it's basically, well, you swing the hi-hat. But the snare is straight. And, you know, so I had a few of these grooves and stuff. And, and, and then when I, a few years later, I did an album with Squeeze. I joined up with Squeeze. And there's a song of theirs called Third Rail, which I use that on. And the, and the drum with Squeeze now has come to me and said the same thing, like, what's that? What are you doing? You know? <laughs> well, so first of all, this is the um, Los Lobos version of it. Fantastic.
So was that, is that deliberate? You flip your left hand stick around to get a little bit more weight? Yeah, to get the... Yeah. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's also years of having to cut through Elvis's, you know, Elvis's amp. Because yeah. he was not quiet. <laughs> and then this is the squeeze version of it. And I use it, you know, I've got a band I play now in LA, a, like a cowboy band. I use it a lot with them. So you're, you're still doing your band? Yeah, Jack Shit. Jack Shit, yes. I had notes to ask you about that. My, my comment was, you clearly like country. What inspired Jack Shit and is it still going? And how was it to work with Johnny Cash? Johnny Cash, now that is a... That's a whole episode. Please, tell me a whole episode on well, Johnny Cash. So we've done a few rock albums with Elvis, and I think he wanted a break from having to write songs and stuff. So we decided it would be Johnny Good Fun to go to America and do a country album in Nashville. All, you know, 22, 23, <laughs> all having way too much fun. And uh, so we went there. CBS Studio A, uh, which was a classic country studio, uh, the producer was Billy Sherrill, who had produced endless country hits with George Jones, but old school. He wasn't really up to speed with uh, a load of new wave idiots, you know. But, <laughs> but um, he had an engineer called Snake, who had snake boots, snake belt, snake everything, snake jacket. Look. And um, they, the first thing we noticed was they both had Berettas in their, in their like, holsters in their back. <laughs> so when you sat behind them on the sofa in the studio, you're looking at two guns all the time. You know. they, it was great. They, the studio was so on. It was so wired. You know, it was in the middle of the room, they had a hut, like a wooden hut, which was where the artist's booth, like a hexagonal hut. It looked like it had just come from a garden center, you know. And, and basically in there, there was a mic, or two mics, you know, one for an acoustic and one for the vocal. And there was a jack plug socket. And, I, I, you know, first of all, Snake just said, okay, drums, kick. It was this kit. You know, okay, snare, Tom, dum, dum, you know, it was that fast. It was like bass, dum, 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 dum. piano, dum, 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 dum. okay, Elvis, you're going to play acoustic or electric? He's like, uh, uh, I think I'll play electric. Okay, plug in the thing there, it's plugged in. It's, uh, it literally took that long. And then they were like, then they just, they just said, so what are we going to cut? And I was like, well, let's do, you know, why don't you love me like you used to do? Or so, you know, some song. And we just started playing it. We just like one, two, three, four, we started playing it. And it, it's just in the headphones, it just sounded like a country record. It was just, it was like, oh my God, you know, like <laughs> you're playing and you just, you're just on a country record. I mean, it was, there's no problem, you know. So we, and then in the middle of the room, they had a pyramid of beers. So anytime you wanted, you could just get up and get and grab a beer, you know. Anyway, so we did that for a few days. And then we got the word that Johnny Cash, did we want to go out to Johnny Cash's house to, to, Heck yeah. to visit Johnny Cash? Because at this, at this point, Nick Lowe had started dating his stepdaughter, Carlene. So there was there was sort of a hookup, but it was really just 
very nice. You know, it was just him being very nice. Like these English guys are in town. And, and so this limo came and picked us up and drove us out to Johnny Cash's house. Like these four idiots, you know, like, like and all with our shiny jackets on and everything. And and we got there, and the first thing we saw was Roy Orbison's house, which had burnt down and killed his wife. Which, but oh. it's it's on Johnny Cash's land, so that was weird. You know, the driver's like, "Hey, there's, you know, Roy Orbison's house." And anyway, we get to Johnny Cash's. And he comes out, that's like, there's Johnny Cash. But he was barefoot, and he's got his shirt out, and it was like, hey, welcome, you know. And there's this beautiful timber house by a lake, all this land, you know. And then June Carter came out, and, and they just welcomed us, you know. And, and so the first thing he says is, um, you want to see my wildlife park? <laughs> We're like, of course we do, you know, yeah, of course, you know. Whatever you want to show us. Let's go, you know. <laughs> so th this van, there was a van there with uh, really nice seats. I remember there was these lovely, like, sort of aircraft seats in it. And so we all piled into this van, and June Carter's there. And then um, John Carter Jr. was there, this little boy. And she said... Um, you go in the house now. You go in the house and you, you get a, some melons for the hogs, you know. And so he ran off and he came back with these melons. And, and then she grabbed him and she put her hand in his pocket and pulled out this jar of caviar. And she called, John Carter Jr., I told you, you do not get the caviar. You're not having any more caviar, you know. And we're all just like, you know, so then we get in the van and we go off through all this, you know, countryside and everything to this, this wood, this spinny. And we get out, Johnny Cash gets one of these melons. And he's going, you want to see my roosh and hogs? I'm like, yeah, of course, you know, of course we do. That's why we're here, you know. And, and he just holds this melon out. Oh, there's a little fence and he holds it out and half of it just disappears in this blur of like hair and tusks, you know. This thing just goes, <laughs> you know, and just takes this melon. You know, I bought those hogs back from Russia under the seat of my Learjet. Like, yeah, of course, you know. And then it's a wildlife park, right? So then at this point, our manager, Jake, is, is there. And then he turns around and there's an ostrich standing next to him, right? like, <laughs> like, like, you know, like, and Jake was pretty feisty. So he, he turns to this ostrich and he goes, Wah! and then the ostrich grabs him by the nose. <laughs> so it went on. Then we went back, we went back to the house. There's, there's, I can't even, be, you know, like, and we're all sitting around this table. Like there, there was a table for Johnny Cash and Elvis and Billy Sherrill and like an upper table. And then the crew and everybody was at the lower table. And then I went, I went in the toilet for a wee, you know. And there was this gigantic black turd in the toilet, you know. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, what am I, you know, like, you know. Like I'm going to go out and everyone's going to think it was me, you know. So I'm trying to flush it. It wouldn't go down. Like, oh, no, you know. So I, I just left it, you know. And then I went and sat down at the table. And then I watched other people going in there. And everyone was coming out like, you know. And um, we never got to the bottom or the right bottom of it, you know. Like, who's Maybe it was it? a joke he was playing on you. I <laughs> think it was a joke. I think it was the, this Johnny Carter Jr., you know. I, I think it was... Cause it, but it was black, you know, and the man in black, you know, the whole thing was just, yeah. it probably was a joke. A inside joke for them. Yeah. But anyway, so we met him then, and, and him and Elvis got on quite well. He gave Elvis a, some rare sun record, you know. And so then Johnny Cash came to England to visit Nick and Carlene. And, and Nick just had this little house in Shepherd's Bush. I mean, it wasn't that little, but... By American standards, it was little. And he had a, a studio in the basement, like no bigger than this. 
But he'd written this song called Without Love, which is a great song. And, um, and we cut it. You know, they got me in to play drums, and I think maybe, maybe Billy Bremner was playing guitar. And, and um, we just cut it with, with Johnny Cash, you know. Incredible. And, you know, like when we got there, we went into the living room and Johnny Cash was there, but he was standing on the hearth with all in black, you know, like just <laughs> fully Johnny Cash. Like there's no, you know, doubt. And, and it actually became sort of a hit. And it's on his great, if you buy Johnny Cash's greatest hits, it's, it's on there. So it's incredible. It's, yeah. It's sort of this weird Johnny way. Johnny Cash hit. I'm on a Johnny Cash pit, you know. What was the... The thinking, so almost blue. I mean, because you know, trust wasn't wasn't a big record. The, the singles weren't big, and you're like six months, less than six months later, you're in a different country making another album. Yeah, I mean, was was there anything about it? Let's just try something different. What was the sort of thought? Well, process? I don't know. I mean, I I don't really know. I mean, we made all the albums pretty close together, and we yeah. and we toured all the time in between. I mean, I was never home. You know, my brother-in-law had to decorate my house, and 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 uh, you know. But if you think back to the Beatles' careers or the Stones, you know, it was because back then albums were products, you know, and and you, you had singles, and and it actually worked, and people actually bought them, and you know, and also Elvis, if he gets an idea in his head, it's very hard for anybody to change his mind, you know. And, I mean, uh, it was a brilliant idea. He went from, from a whisperer to a scream, watch your step, and then suddenly Good, for you, good, year, for good year for the Roses comes out and it's top 10 and everybody's talking about, wow, the direction changed. Yeah, well, it's just because it's such a great song, you know. Incredible song. And, and it's just some, we just managed to hit a good compromise with this English guy singing it and, you know, you don't know when that magic just happens, but it's, Luckily, it sort of did, and and the video was hilarious. You know, yeah. we we just stopped in at some guest house on the way to Scotland, and there were these twin sisters there. And I think I think maybe we must have had a camera with us or something, but it was very off the cuff. You know, and our manager Jake was just like, "This is it. Come on, we're just going to do it here. You know, just get a camera and mime along to it." But that was, you know, the whole country thing, you know. And we had John McPhee playing pedal steel from Clover, yeah. you know, who went on to join the Doobie Brothers. And he's always, he's still friends. And he actually invited me to play with the Doobie Brothers at one of their shows, which I never quite recovered from. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm like, well, what song shall I do? He said, oh, listen to the music. I'm like, John, don't be stupid. He's like, yeah, come on, we'll do it as an encore. You can come on at the end and do listen to the music. I'm like, oh, yeah, right, that's a great idea. But I did, I ended up doing it, and it was just amazing. You know, it just started off with that doom, ga -duk, doom, ga -duk, duk, duk, duk. But, you know, no, I, I had a lot of, good experiences along the way. Well, tell me a little bit about Jack Shit. <laughs> so it's the end of the 90s, and I'm doing more and more sessions in LA, mostly with Mitchell Froome. Then we did an album with this lady called Vonda Shepard. Uh, you know, it was just an album, and, um, and we did it. And then she said to me, I do a TV show, or I'm going to be doing it. No, she was doing a TV show called Ali McBeal. She was the producer of the, all the music on Ali McBeal. And she said, would you like to be the, the drummer, you know, the first call resident drummer? She said, it's going to go for at least three years. You know, it's two or three sessions a week, double scale. Because the whole gag with that show was all the music that they had. You know, there was always a Tamla Motown, Tamla Motown song, there was always a gospel song, there was always a guest. So I jumped at the chance. My daughter was 14, and she was just about to really get stuck into her O-levels, 
So I still remember the phone call. And I called her and just said, look, we can stay in England. You can do your O-levels. She was at Putney High. You can, or you can move to LA, you know, you can go. And I, I'd been around and looked at some schools. I said, you know, you can go to school probably in, you know, West, West Hollywood somewhere. My or... mum went to Putney High. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, you know exactly. I know exactly what you mean. And, um, you know, what do you think? She's like, Dad, you know what? You know, cause, and you don't do any exams till you're 18, really. And she's like, I think I'll be all right, you know, I'll be all right in America, you know. So, so I took the job, and my wife and daughter moved to Los Angeles, and I did that for three years, you know, and, and that, that was fantastic. You know, one week it was, it was um, Chubby Checker, you know, and then we had Sting on and... and um, did all sorts of people, you know. Uh, uh, Al Green we did one week. Incredible. So you're in the studio with Al Green, for God's sake, you know. And and that, and that also being in the studios in L.A. every week meant you bumped into a lot of people. And so it was good for getting sessions and things. Yeah, Chubby Checker. We did the track with him, you know, like Let's Twist Again. And then if we weren't busy, we could go on set and be the band because there was always a scene in a bar with whoever was singing. So we, we did it with Chubby Checker. Um, this is all, basically, this gets me back to Jack Shit because that's who Jack Shit were. Jack Shit were the band on Ali McBeal. And we discovered that we all like country, soul, electric, you know, we all had the same dream. Um, so we started doing that on the side, the jack shit. But also we'd be doing these sessions for Ali McBeal. And, and this one day we were waiting for Chubby Checker to, to arrive. We're on, on the set and he comes in and he's got the wig on. He's got this skin tight denim suit, kind of like Aaron Neville, you know, like pump. And, <laughs> and he comes up on the stage and he looks at us, the three of us, and he says, gentlemen, show me your moves. And Val and Davey, you know, they're <laughs> like, what? You know, they're like, <laughs> he's like, no. Put a little dip in it on the four. Two, three, four, like that. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you ever find that clip, we're all, you know, it's like twist again. Like we did, uh, so, you know, we're all doing. <laughs> oh God, you know that. So that was good, and that that bonded jack shit. You know, you know, we just started doing clubs and things, and we've never really done much more than that. But but it's the antidote to songwriters and sessions because we don't do any original material. We just do all great songs. You know, kind of obscure ones, but. But it's a release, really. And, and they're really funny, like Davey and Val, they're hilarious. Like Davey, who's the bass player in The Imposters, is shorty shit. And he's the, <laughs> we're all from a, t uh, a town, a mythical town, 90 miles south of Bakersfield, called Cocktoten. <laughs> Cocktoten. So we're jack shit from Cocktoten. And Davey is the bird calling champion of Cocktoten. <laughs> so somewhere in the show, he'll be called upon to do like the three toed hairy bush tit or some, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, people like it because it's fun, it's light hearted, you know. To make sweet love to you. All right. We'll get your face all pretty and your head done right. Because we're going to do the town tonight. Coming into town and I'm right on time. I got your loving on my mind. I'm coming home. I gotta make some love. I'm coming home. Sweet turtle dove, I'm coming home. To make sweet love to you.
Elvis came to a Jack Shit gig. Elvis was touring with just Steve at the time. So he said, well, why don't you two come down to the next show and do the encore? So we did. And then that was it. That was the beginning of the imposters, really. So that sort of, like the session thing kind of went away a bit because then we started just making albums again with Elvis and touring with Elvis and, you know, people's perception of what you're doing changes, you know, it's, you know, he's in the band again or whatever, you know, and, and also it's, the session thing is definitely um, like a fashion, you know, you're in vogue and then not so much, you know, because I'm not really a great reader. So, you know, I can't just do the kind of anonymous stuff, you know, like film music and things. I mean, I've done some film music, but it's generally doing what we do rather than reading the chart, you know. Which sort of leads us to what we were talking about earlier. You feel that you're hired more for who you are, for your groove, for your feel, for your ideas. I think so. I think so, yes. It's not just to be a generic uh, session drummer. They're hiring you for your style. I suppose. Your creativity. Well, and, you know, there's a particular snare drum sound, you know, like this one, the biscuit tin, you know, that's... You know, quite often I, I won't do a whole album. I'll do three tracks on an album, and generally they sort of sound like something I would do, you know. I mean, I've been doing a lot of Latin stuff, Lately, I've just done an album with a guy called Juanes, who's very popular. That won a Grammy. So that's Congrats. nice. So about 10 years ago, um, Elvis went to Miami and he wrote some music for a ballet in Miami. One of the guys producing the music down there was called Sebastian Chris. And then it turned out he was a big fan, a really big fan of Elvis and the Attractions. And then I think he said something to Elvis. So anyway, he got my number from Elvis. Some, somehow he got my number. And just out of the blue one day, he called me because he, he is basically a, a Latin producer. He's got like 25 Grammys. You know, he's, he's, um, he's, he's made loads of huge records, you know, in the Latin world. So he started hiring me to play on some of these records. So there was a, an LA band called Santa Cecilia who were making an album. So I played on that and it did really well. It actually won a Grammy, they won a Grammy. And this song was a bit of a hit. I mean, this is me sort of playing Latin groove, which he didn't really want me to play it properly, which is fortunate. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he wanted a sort of English take on it, so... Bonito tu trajecito con todas 
por la apariencia Bonito tu cochecito, no te pesa en la conciencia Brillante tu anillito, te pasaste de la cuenta Muy fancy tu relojito, es de downtown, no me mientas Tu vida se ve oscura sin el brillo en la moneda Nada, nada se te luce si no es nuevo de la tienda Y yo que tengo poquito me alcanza para la fiesta Me río y no necesito Well, also, you know, especially on the Latin records, there'll be some that are really, you know, some of the tracks will be very traditional, you know, which I could bluff, but I'm not the, that guy, you know. But then they'll have some that'll be more rocking and, you know. But I still, you know, I've done, a, I did a session with Mitchell a couple of weeks ago with Rufus Wainwright, which was, and Susanna Hoffs, done, doing a track together. So That's wonderful. I love Sue. She's, she's, she's really nice. Yeah, she's I, I, I did an album with her a while back. And, and the Bengals come and sit in with Elvis, you know. They come and... Well, because he wrote a song for them called Doll Revolution. I hope you enjoyed that. There's actually going to be a part two, so stay tuned for part two. Thanks, everybody, for watching. So long, farewell, Zayn, au revoir, adios. Goodbye, ciao.